Hi guys, welcome back. This is The Coach's Room, episode six. Today we've got Jack Trenchard on with myself, Ryan, Harry and James. Uh, Jack, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction about yourself? Yeah, so um, cheers for having me on, guys. Um, so I've just finished my eighth year at club football, uh, seven within the foundation phase, six or sort of five and a half at Oxford United and two at Reading. Um, it's been quite a journey and quite funny how some of the questions have popped up, to be fair, just looking at them for the first time. So it'd be quite interesting to share my experiences of those questions. So. Yeah, perfect. Great stuff, great stuff. Let's jump straight in, shall we? Right. Let's go. So, looking at the first topic, um, quite a broad, broad question, but I'm <coughs> going to a bit of debate. Uh, is it too difficult for coaches to rank, uh, to progress through the ranks? So, looking at going from grassroots to academy, academy through to the top of the academy, to the youth team, and then, you know, pushing into the first team. Would well, anyone want to start? I've not really looked into it myself. I've I've only been coaching what say three can't remember now three four years. Not really looked into the whole progression side because I coach during the day for work. So kind of just coach on evenings and weekends for for the enjoyment really. So I've not really looked into it. But I think quite a big thing when it comes to progression is like how does it work for that person? So lots of people are into coaching kind of through their kids. So they've kind of got their careers and then they're doing coaching, especially grassroots, because their kid's there. And then it's if if that kid stops playing, if they get old enough, do they then continue coaching, which I think holds a few people back. I kind of think I'm at my level now, can't see myself going any further. So they don't really put, don't really look into that side of things. Could, could you kind of argue that it goes back to, to people's kind of desire and passion for coaching? So you know for myself personally playing playing football at academy level you know i love playing the game and i want to stay involved Um, you know i, I obviously don't have any kids or or you know nephews um that i can go out and train their team and, and you know build their team for them so kind of for me it's been you know about me in a way if that kind of comes across right um and so it hasn't been really to facilitate anyone related to you know, like you're saying with the dads and lads or you know a mum might take a team it's not been like that for me from the other side of it it's been quite for me it's how can I get to the next level and that's yeah, kind of my, my passion for, for trying to get to a high level I don't know about you right but talking from your academy set up Jack you might help as well but how, what's the ratio like in terms of people like you right who are in it as a coach because they want to be in a coach and how many are into it because they're with their kid and maybe some of the best coaches have probably been put into it through their kid i'm not like saying that's not the case but you know what i mean how many aren't are coaching without children for example yeah yeah and i think uh, quite a lot of the coaches that we work with at preston uh, they have a lot of them at the moment uh, have really young kids as well as their coaching um so it's a kind of a mixed message in a way obviously they were doing it before they've had kids but to actually continue doing it with kids, you know, obviously shows that there's a passion and, and a belief behind what they're doing. For me, uh, one of the big things would be what is progression. So, so what would you define if you'd, ask me, if you'd asked me eight years ago what progression would be, I was mean like get to a club, find the highest age group you could find in them, so get to the 16, 17 youth team, and that would be your way through. But having gone for you know from cat three to cat one. But it's not actually progressing through the age groups that everyone thinks. Everyone thinks you've got to be at the top, you know, the top age groups to progress. And it's actually, can you be the best, you know, find the age group that's best for you? And that's what's going to carry you through in terms of that progression. Um, in terms of getting into clubs, you've got to be willing to be poor. You can, you're not going to make a lot of money. And I think that's one of the things everyone, you know, from coming from the grassroots kind of forgets about, you know, the progression is going to be, it is going to be one of the toughest things you go through. Because you're going to have to give up so much time and so much hours and so much, you know, driving up and down to you, you know, because you're going to have to move clubs. It's just absolute chaos and it's horrible because the numbers for the game, as you all know, it's an overcrowded workforce. Definitely, yeah. So, but, uh, tough. You, you kind of highlighted it then, Jack, that, you know, finding your age group and, and you know, that's kind of your definition of progression going from Cat 3 to Cat 1 is finding your age group that works best for you. Could you say that some people's desire is to just kind of go, right, I've coached at 5v5 level, then 7v7, 9v9, and then I want to play the full game. I want to be there and live in the full game. You know, could could that be 
someone else's desire to progress through not because they may not see it as oh, I'm perfect for seven v seven coaching or nine v nine coaching under twelves. I'm going to stick here because because some people are going to think well if I'm good at what I'm doing why don't I try and make it further? Oh, big time! So for things like eleven v eleven, um, the demands you're going to have from eleven v eleven at Cat One compared to the eleven v eleven you're going to have at Cat Three is massive, absolutely massive, just because of who you come up against. And that's nothing to do with yourself. Like, that's just naturally how the board, the spectrum is going to drag you along. So um, for me, it's kind of take your time. You know, you just find where you're going to go, and the progression will naturally come off. As long as you can look at yourself and say you've worked your hardest, and through a lot of people I've kind of had beneath me in different age groups and coming through other places, they haven't worked as hard as they've made out. So it always kind of comes against themselves. And the ones will always eventually, you'll always get through that glass ceiling. Whether it takes you seven years or six years or even two years, eventually you will get through. Yeah, I think there's a quite a protruding message there that, you know, if you be yourself and, and you know, if you be honest yourself, honest self, sorry, and give everything you've got, and, you know, you give you, you put yourself out there on, for, on display for everyone to see, you know, that you, you can't really go backwards in a way. You can only go forwards. You know, you're showing yourself as an honest person, hard working. You know, you can only go up in a, in a certain aspect, can't you? And also, it's the open mindedness. You know, once you get into a club, don't be afraid to look outside of a club. I think sometimes you can get so, you know, like, I'll, I'll put my hands up straight away after five years at one club. I was so fixated on that one pathway and not really, I, I, I didn't have a clue what was going on outside. Didn't have a clue, you know, and eventually you think, hang on a minute, I could have learned A, B, C, D, E, and E. FG, all sorts going outside, you know, and that six, seven months passes just like that. And you sit there and you think, well, have I really got any better? Um, so sometimes you're your own issue for progression as well. Yeah, and I, I think that highlights. Go on, James. Sorry. No, I didn't say nothing. I think it was oh, Jack. Sorry, Paul. sorry but, um, yeah, and I think that kind of highlights that there's a net networking aspect to this as well. Going back to the original question, is it too difficult for coaches to progress through the ranks? You know, there's a massive, massive networking skill involved there. You know, if if you say, take myself, for example, I've played football, you know, I'm going to have contacts with coaches that have previously coached me who might be still in the game or, you know, I might have met someone who undertook my, my level two or my UEFA B. You know, there's going to be loads of people that I'm going to meet through coaching. And, you know, Harry, you've got a massive social media presence. You know, you're going to meet loads of people. People are always going to be willing to help you. And, and I think that that can massively impact you know, your progression through the ranks? I think, oh, I'm just going to take this in a different direction completely. And um, it goes back to the question that Jack said, which was, what is progression? Now, the thing is, when you work with the best players, it doesn't necessarily make you progress as a coach. So working with players that have less ability sometimes, or in grassroots clubs, or even with younger players that don't have the ability to, to play the game naturally, and you really have to, you know, think about their development and how they progress and how to get the best out of them makes you progress a lot as a coach, meaning that when you're with players in the future that actually, you know, might have the capacity to play, it makes your job a lot easier and you've dealt with a lot of different situations or difficult situations in your, you know, first five or six years, which gives you the confidence to then man-manage um, a lot of scenarios that you get in senior and, and under, you know, under 19 and under 18 level. I would just think that I, I know a lot of coaches that are academy coaches. I know a lot of um, coaches that are ex-academy coaches as well. And I think that you probably learn from both environments. You learn from being in an environment of, you know, following a philosophy and, you know, maybe the academy system. And I think you learn a, a hell of a lot as well. You know, being on kind of like on your own, discovering a lot of things um, day by day and being with, you know, players that might not have the capability of doing everything perfectly or executing everything you you ask from them. So I think like the question is, what is progression for you? Um, is it is it about you as a coach? Is it about the players? Is it about the rank? Is it what other people think about you? Is that the issue? Like, what is your rank? That would be the question as well. Like, what is rank to you? Speaking of, that, just speaking of, go on, Jamesy, go on. Just something on those lines, Harry, like you say about progression and it links to what Ryan was saying about kind of being open to other people. Something I took from the two courses there. Uh, so say, imagine one of your sessions that didn't go really well and then you reflect on it afterwards and say what could have went better. How many times as the coach would you go back and then do that session again but with the changes afterwards? Because I've never done that. 
So I, I'll go back home after a session and think about what went well and how I'd change it, but I'd never put that into practice. So it's kind of been open to trying the, the first attempt and then improving on it and going out and doing it again. It might be the week after, it might not look like you're progressing through the kid, what they think, but you're kind of progressing yourself by coming up with a, a better way of doing it. And I think that's really important that we recognise that. And I can't remember who it was on a on a recent episode that kind of said that. I think it might have been Graham that said, you know, while we're progressing the players, we've still got to progress ourselves as coaches as well. We can't forget that, you know, we can develop in this time as well. You know, obviously, you know, it's got to be a player centred approach. But before and after, we can have time to reflect, time to analyse what we're doing and why, and how is it benefiting us. Us, you know, at the same time as equal beneficial, uh, beneficial time for. For the players as well. I'm going to swing this kind of 180, a big U-turn on this, but kind of a a bit of a different question around the topic, around is it too difficult for coaches to progress through the ranks, is do pro players impact the progression of non-pro playing coaches? If you can get your head around that. So do do professional players who come into the academy to coach actually hinder you know, young coaches coming through the ranks? 100%. 100%. Yeah. Why? That's why, why? That's why, why? Making, making something for yourself is you're probably not going to do it at a professional club. They're, you're probably going to get a lot less opportunities and no reasoning really why, meaning you could be left out of a situation being a magnificent coach. And that really depends how much self-awareness and self-confidence you have in yourself. I've always thought this, you're going to make it in a club, um, say Conference National or, or a non-pro club, you've got to make it there as a manager, I think, and then get the invite to become a manager directly in where you want to be, rather than going through the ranks at a club. I think once they see you as like the under-16 the under sixteen coach or the under-8 coach or the under-10 coach or whatever academy, it's kind of difficult to consider you going to be an under-23 of reserves team coach. You know, you might make it through the ranks, but, you know, it depends how professional we're talking as well. You know, are we talking about the pro-pro level? Are we talking about um, championship? Are we talking League One, League Two? You know, these different clubs have different um, philosophies and different coaches. But, you know, if, if, if we're talking about the pro-pro teams, you know, someone who comes in with a, with a name is always going to be put in front of you in most yeah. occasions. Yeah. I think that's important that you say, Harry, about philosophy, because... Yes, Frank Lampard might not be the best manager yet, but he's came all the way through Chelsea's ranks, hasn't he? Well, apart from the start where he was at West Ham, but he's kind of played most of his career at Chelsea and then got into coaching and then they thought, well, why don't we bring him back when they needed a coach? Because he knows the club, he knows stuff like that. So I think that does play quite a big part of it, kind of knowing the surroundings and knowing and how he the was club clever. James, he was clever. He had, he had Jody Morris, which is, has been coaching, if I'm not mistaken, a few years in the UEFA um, youth. He's won the Champions League UEFA youth with, with the under-18s. He's been there and he's got him as an assistant coach. He's been clever. He's surrounded himself with people. This is what I think Zidane did really, really, really well, which I don't think nobody really focused too much on it. He won three Champions Leagues. Well, nobody asked is what staff did he have around him? You know, it's all about us. I don't see Zidane being a, a fantastic manager. Just look into his staff. You know, you don't always have to be a fantastic manager yourself. You just need to put up with a lot of situations that a manager has to deal with. And Zidane has to deal with a lot less because he's Zidane. You know, but those, those people that are around you do a lot. And that maybe is progressing through the lengths to the capacity that you might be able to, you know. You might get that lucky stride that, that it might go another way. And somebody might come in and say, well, I've got all my staff. I don't need you. And they can go both ways. Yeah, I think as well, going back to uh, Ryan's que like follow-up question on that, it's kind of like the whole like Phil Foden at Man City situation where they could spend time progressing him and making sure he's the best number 10 or wherever they want to play him at possible at that club. But then they can go and spend 40, 50, 60, however much million on getting someone who's ready now. So it's just quite the same in coaches that... I was going to say that, James. He could could that reflect coaching in a well? It does reflect coaching in a massive way? Oh, yeah. do, you, do you promote someone from from within your youth who's grew up who's grew up on these philosophies? You know, as a coach who's spent years underpinning their philosophy of, of a club, 
or do you go out and spend you know thousands of pounds on a wage per week on this manager who's had success elsewhere but maybe doesn't get the club depends how patient they want to be if they that's why i think chelsea are quite clever and quite bold at the same time to go for lampard because the he's not going to go in and win two of his within the first two seasons he's, he's quite a long-term thing but i think they're quite clever with that but what about pressure from the outside from fans well I, personally i i don't think it might sound bold, but I don't think the pressure from fans should influence. I think if they understand the vision of the club, then they should be on board with whoever the club decides to bring in. You know, if it's if they're looking, say, to to progress into Europe over the next five years and push on to win to win cups and, and major events within the next six to seven years, you know, they've got to back maybe someone younger or maybe someone who's come through the ranks and knows the club because. You know, they they can wait, and you know they can allow this process to happen over time. Whereas, you know, if the club are a big club, for Man United, for example, who who say we, you know, we want to be in Champions League next year, we want to be winning the league within two years, then yeah, you're going to go for a bigger manager because they can have that impact. Whereas maybe a younger manager who maybe isn't well as known, maybe needs time to develop in, into that role himself. Yeah. Quite funny that question actually talking to me. So Newcastle got Steve Bruce in charge and then there's all the talk about the takeover. Well, apparently we've got Pochettino, we're looking for a leg we were this, that, the other. <clears throat> like you say, do, they, do we want to be patient with it if it, if all this happens? Or like you say, do we want to pick someone who's got like a project in mind over the next four, five, six years and kind of be in it for the long run rather than and who's just going to be there for a season? I think I think like though that the I think the the perfect example was bringing in Andre Villas Boas at Tottenham. You know, it, I, I'm sure it was him when they brought in you know so many players. They, I think they brought in seven or eight players within one one transfer and played them. You know, instantly they, they basically formed a new eleven, and it was like there was no cohesion. They had no idea what was going on. It, was, it didn't end well, and obviously he got the sap from it. But it's that kind of fine balance of. When when do you want success and how are we going to do it? And I think that kind of goes for, I, for coaches as well. Read it, like an online article. I think it was about Villas Boas when he was at Chelsea, and it was a list of players that he brought in, and it had the likes of Lukaku, De Bruyne, Salah, like three of the <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say Lukaku was one of the best players in the world, but three really like players who went on to make of themselves. But like you say, it's getting the everything. That, Right, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it, it went back to a book. I can't remember what the book was called. I read it a few months ago. I think it was The Numbers Game, it might have been. And it spoke about uh, Vyash Boas at Chelsea and that he should have been given way more time. You know, he was, he'd recently become into a first team position. Um, they didn't really give him time to settle. It was almost like once he got a few string of bad games under him, they were happy to let him go. And it's like, you know, if you're going to give the coach this was massive responsibility with this a massive amount of money and pressure you've got to give him time or her you know to to just grow into the role themselves as well you know you can't throw them in the deep end and expect them to swim straight away you know there's things dragging them down and you've got to be there to support them anyway let's let's move on to to the second topic that was a great first discussion love that um, so next topic, we're going to go for how have tactics and or analysis evolved over the last decade in youth and pro football? Anyone want to fire away? I'll kick us off. I don't have a problem with that. Personally, I've read the book um, Inverting the Pyramid um, and I'm still reading it now. I'm absolutely loving it. But I think that, and that, that highlights a lot of culture within tactics as well. But I think do we, are we becoming too structured in a way? Are we kind of losing that creative side of a formation and tactics? Um, I reckon the last 18 months have probably gone more fluid again. So I remember when it was literally, you playing nine aside, it was just every team were playing 3-3-2. Three, three, Everything was literally, as you said, structure routine, players, roles and responsibilities. This is what you need to do. This is what you go and do. And you find them players to fill those roles. Um, whereas now, totally different totally different. Um, players can move to where they need to on the pitch. They're totally more aware of what they need to do. 
And that comes down for me to the second part, and that's the better analysis. So players can now see games from up high. They can actually visualise. Um, one of the things I hate doing is using the tactics board and putting counters on, moving them about, because one, then players can't, they, they do not sense those movements from that board for what they see on the pitch. So for me, the second part of the analysis is totally overtaken the tactics part and totally made these boys so much more fluid, more 360. Um, and that's probably the massive point in the analysis part for me was made the difference in the nine years that I've been doing club football. Yeah, massively. And do you believe that's down to as well? England, the English FA and, and, you know, coaches as a whole grasping this idea that a player should be able to play, especially when they're younger, from defence all the way through to, to the striker position, you know, given that, that whole range of experiences. So when they do start to, you know, kind of take to, to a left-back position or a centre-mid position that they actually know already, they don't have to be taught the roles and responsibilities. You know, they've, they've analysed it with their own eyes, as well as from above that, how do I see the game in this position? How might it change from when I'm higher up the pitch or, or deeper in the pitch? And and giving them that that fluidity, like you were saying, Jack, of being able to move to where they need to be without having to think, ah, oh, you know, I've got to be there because my manager told me to. Oh, massively. Um, you just have to look at the noise on the sidelines compared to what it used to be. Remember when I first started, you could hear boys on the pitch. You could not, no matter what, even at the, you know, you could not hear players on the pitch because all you could hear was both sidelines screaming. And this is under 11s, under 12s. And what decisions are they making? They're not making any decisions. Not at all. They are just literally just running around the pitch. And then as soon as they get quiet, the games just fell apart. Games would fall apart if it went quiet. So, whereas now it's the other way around. It's the boys who are making all the decisions and coaches. You know, a certain team we played, it was literally, he said to his boys, you know what you need to do, off you go. And I didn't hear him for 90 minutes. I, I think that's brilliant that, that coaches can just stand back in a way and, yeah. and you know, let, let the, the kids be the kids in a way. You know, you've got to remember so, that they are not adults as well, that they are, they've got to go and explore stuff. When you're lucky, when you have to get three sessions, four sessions a week sometimes, you're building them up for the Sunday. So if you've done everything right in the week, you should have the ifs, the maybes, the buts, whatever you need to do, the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, what they need to sense, they're deciding they do. They go out and do that. That's the only way they're going to go and learn. There's no point me sitting there saying, well, you didn't sense this, you didn't decide that, you didn't do that all the time. Because they've got to fail. They have to think sometimes to go and, go and swim, learn to swim. Um, and the analysis part of that is, for me, is huge. With Huddle and uh, with Huddle's one of me, was absolutely incredible. Yeah, massively, definitely. I think we were, you touched on it well last week, Ryan, about the, <clears throat> the ideal, ideal situation of having a, like a relaxed game where the, the kids can kind of pick their own positions, their own formations. I think this ties in well. If if we could, like Jack says, have a game where the parents don't talk, we don't talk as coaches, we just put the kids on the pitch, maybe we tell them in the breaks where they are and what we want from them, and then June won't say anything. I think that would teach us quite a lot about the kids and what they actually know and how much they're being told by either our side or the parents' side. Yeah, and I think it stood out. I recently, about about a year ago, went up to Man United and to watch my younger brother play. And it, I've been there a few times, but I've, I've been there as a coach and a player. But this time I just went as a spectator. And you sit, you stand in a bit of a gantry almost. You, you know, you're thirty yards back from the pitch, and you and you're thirty yards up as well. And it's amazing the impact that it has on the parents. You know, they are completely silent. They'll chat between themselves and they'll kind of say, "Oh, well done," like under their own breath. But there's no shouting because they're not near the pitch. And I think it was really beneficial, actually. The players kind of went, I can't hear my mum or daddy. This, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm just playing, actually. This is great. Like, oh, our like local, the, the uh, impact that had is amazing. Our local FA had launched it. Like, a silent a few, few weeks later, everything kicked off with this virus. But I think it got for bad weather. But I think I was really looking forward to that because we were told on the sidelines that we can't we can't give instructions during the game, we can't even give praise. We've got to just be silent and let the kids get on with it, which I thought was a really good idea, but didn't happen. But hopefully that will come back again and again. I James, think it's quite, go on, Harry. I just, no, I just wanted to ask, like, um, James, on this question, is it have tactics and analysis from a coaching point of view or from a player's point of view? I think it was more based around one of my questions, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah. say that again, Harry. Was it more coaches is it from or a, from the game? Is it from a player? Have, have they evolved as in players or have they evolved well, as in the coaches in the youth development? Kind of take it as you feel, really. Kind of spark a bit of debate. Well, I, I just believe like now we have so many tools. It's getting to a point where if we're talking about a decade, 
So I've lately been reading Zonal Marking by Michael Cox, and it starts off talking about, um, in Holland, the debates between, or um, the controversy between Johan Cruyff and, and Van Gaal and how they implemented football from different points of view and you know how they kind of like dealt or created a lot of what um, Dutch football is today. And it's kind of like, has tactics evolved from then until now? I think it probably has slightly, but I don't think it has massively. I think what a lot of coaches have done have co copied and adapted. They've copied what works, which makes total sense, and they've adapted what doesn't in slight portion. I saw a little video the other day, and I actually think I sent it to our group, which was how Guardiola played in Barcelona, then when he went to Bayern Munich, then when he went to Man City. Obviously, we're talking about youth, so I think how many coaches actually watch games and analyze games in youth, I'm surprised that I, I believe there's a lot of... Um, there's a little, little consistency or frequency where coaches sit down and watch games. I mean, I do it every two days, and I think I should be doing it even more. Like one or two games, we've got so much information out there, but I believe we're, a lot of us are distracted, and a lot of us are focusing on things like ball mastery technique and stuff like this, which is fun, which is ideal, which is great for the kids and enjoying it. But I don't think a lot of coaches have a clear picture of what their tactics look like and how they analyze a game and how they would ask their analyzer to ask a game and how to teach players as well how to analyze a game from the inside, from being a player, from a player's point of view, and obviously from the outside, picking up stats. I, I'm not too sure we've evolved that much in analyzing the game. There is tools out there that would do it for you. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of tools out there now that, and a lot of a lot of parents starting to video the game, but I'm not sure if they're using this footage in youth. You know, obviously there's the pro clubs, which is one case scenario, and we're talking, you know, grassroots clubs, which is a grand majority. So do we think that we're really, and grassroots coaches are analyzing games or implementing new tactics to what they see, to what they feel, or are they just copy and paste and seeing what happens? I like that. Really like that. Um, right, we're gonna gonna put a little. Can I just add something to that? Can I just add something to that? Yeah, Jack. Can we? Do you know what? We'll come back to it in a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're just gonna take a quick tea break, uh, and we'll we'll get things firing away in a second. We'll be back in about ten fifteen seconds. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, Jack. We Welcome back. So we've just had our quick tea break then. Um, welcome back to part two of episode six of the Coaches Room. Jack, do you want to finish off your, off your point? Yeah, I'm just going to go back off uh, Harry's point about um, analysis. Um, for me, I remember one of my first points, I used to, like you say, I'm watching the game. I used to be very, I want to see pressing, I'm looking at pressing only. So I remember giving the duties to someone else about possession and um, forward passing and stuff. And the stats came back of this, this is what you're doing. Everyone was really happy. And I looked at it thinking, we just got popped. We just lost the game, 3-1, three, three, I think it was. I think, how was everyone so happy with the stats that come from the Monday morning? But when you actually broke down what the stats and the forward passes actually were, and to the person that was doing the stats from one of the interns at the time, it looked great. But what they weren't looking at was the, the bigger pictures. So you've got players in three phases time who's already running that. That's the pass that should have been into the next man to there, not the one that's trying to break the line through the middle. So when you actually broke the game down, I think it... I'm just going to make a random note of how many it was. I reckon it was around 70% of the passes they put forward as forward passes with the wrong option. And for me as a coach, that was probably the biggest point I thought, ah, I need to, you know, I need to actually go and sit down with these guys and this is what we need. No, that isn't a forward pass. That, you know, yes, it's forward into there, but it's a lot of turnover or it's put us into a, a negative numbers advantage. So what is a good forward pass? And once we've done that, the season literally flipped round because everyone was on the same message. But if I hadn't clocked that, I reckon that would have passed for another six months. I was and just going to say that, Jack. That six months, that, as you know, in football is an absolute eternity. Yeah, I was, I was just going to kind of say that, Jack, that, you know, you, you said then about looking at the bigger picture, you know, you've got your analysis, your analysts looking at, you know, the forward pass completion rate and, and you know, you're looking at the pressing side, but, you know, working in tandem as an actual group of coaches or, you know, as a backroom staff, I think that's how tactics have evolved and analysis have evolved massively. You know, you're saying that 
that kind of moment where you said we need to work as a collective here and it kind of the season flipped on a switch almost and I think that has been a real evo- like evolution of, of analysis recently definitely big thing that links back to what Harry was saying is <clears throat> it seems like every time there's a World Cup come around there's a new thing to, that you see a lot of teams follow it was can't remember off the top of my head but one of the World Cups it was from then on everyone started playing three at the back I think Chelsea took it really well Chelsea won the league off following that kind of trend of playing three centre-halves and wing-backs and however else they played. But I think it's kind of been open to what the rest of the world are doing. So like Holland or back on the up the Netherlands. So I think a lot of people are watching some of their games and thinking, right, how can I implement that into our style? How can we make that work for us? I think it's like I would say, is take the good bits out of what might work and then kind of trying to think about what might not work and how does that, how is that going to work for us type of thing. Yeah, and I think that, like, Harry, you've read Inverting the Pyramid as well, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And, um, and that is a real message, James, what you're on about there. That <coughs> every time a World Cup came round, they did. There seemed to be, you know, it was either the 2-3-5, the then going to a 4-4-1-1, 4-4-2, then three at the back. You know, every time there was a new World Cup, there was a new role. There was the Libero, uh, I think it was called, like, the Retina, Retina Casio or something like that. Um, and every single time there was a World Cup, that there was a new formation, there was a new model to approach the game. But that depends with. a lot on the press, right? I mean, the World Cup is probably the second event after the Super Bowl most viewed in the world, you know, so, and everybody's on break. You know, it's not like if you go and analyse what Wolves are doing or what Sheffield United have done this season, which is unbelievably, you know, something completely out of the, the new, how he uses his centre back to, to create an overload on the side. You know, that's I haven't seen that in pro football in my life. You know, and he's doing it in the Premier League after coming up from the Championship. Could you say that's because of maybe the time period, though? You know, you've got a World Cup every four years where teams are going Yeah, no, no, to totally. That's why it's the most huge event. Because you've yeah, got... Yeah. You can only ever win that every, every four years. That's why everybody wants to win a World Cup. Because you only yeah, get maybe three shots yeah. at it in your whole life. Yeah. That's it. So like, I watched France play Belgium um, 2018 the other day with two or three of my players. We actually watched the, the first half and then I stayed with a couple more to watch the second half. And, you know, Belgium set up a really interesting team for that World Cup with some, you know, interesting tactics as well. France in the second half of that semi-final hardly went past the halfway line, you know, and everybody's bragging on about how good, you know, how many stars France have got and um, you know how many attacking players they've got they didn't go past the halfway line after scoring the first goal they played a Catanaccio type of parking the bus <laughs> and trying to break with MVP which you probably would do in the semi-final of a World Cup because you know we might only be here again or I might not have the same team but when it comes to the truth you know style of play tactics it just all comes down to winning yeah and knowing what you've got um, my favourite was Greece in the Euros when they won the Euros they knew they had the boys that could win the set pieces and they knew the boys that could drop off and defend robust I think they had more corners than their goals or, you know all those weird things that they'd done I think they scored one goal from open play didn't they or, you know, so they yeah. knew how they were going to get they knew how they were going to get a result and they affected and I think that gets lost in academy football I think sometimes you see especially after the um, South Americans did so well with pressing and a high energy pace all the academy teams went to go and play this way and then all of a sudden they were all getting opened up by one ball over the top because they'd forgotten the principles of play. So football's just always cat and mouse and things moving and changing. And as long as you can give that whole approach to all your players, you should be able to counter that round. Hence in France, like you said, they were Belgium. Everyone thought they would go over, you know, they'd go and attack, but they really learned that way and that's how they're going to get past Belgium. Um, but I just find it's a big cat and mouse game. Big cat and mouse game. Is love it? That, uh, the cat and the mouse. Yes. Good way definitely. Yeah, I love that. I think, you know, there's a, there's a big kind of chess element to it, you know, that, you might have a move, you know, 10 minutes earlier that could open up a move for the opposition that could really exploit you. You know, you could send you right back on with 10 minutes left of the game and within, you know, five minutes of that happening, you know, their right mid or their left mid has gone to score on two minutes, in, uh, two goals in two minutes. You know, it is a massive, you know, kind of pros and cons game, isn't it? Totally. If I, if I look at it, going back to the question, about well, tactics and analysis, and analysis, looking at it from grassroots, obviously we don't have the likes that you might have mentioned before, Jack, about 
people who will do that type of work for you don't have that level of detail back in in grassroots but something i like the idea of and i haven't got the chance to do it enough with my players is like for when they're when they're off when they're substitutes give them a whiteboard and let them tally something so it's how many good bits of pressure do you see how many forward passes that cutting i think that's a good way of making and I've not had the chance to do that as much as I would like to, but I think that's one way of getting the kids kind of learning at the same time as well. I've done yeah, this could... once, Jamesy. Um, we were at Man City. I've done it once with, with one of the under eights where I kind of said, you know, what did we work on this weekend? I, it was something like finishing in the final third and he said shooting or striking, well, attacking. And I, I was like, great, all right, I want you to make a presentation. He was, he was a sub for that period. So I want you to make a presentation on, on what you see from the boys, you know, in this period. So we had attacking at the top and he said, we've had eight shots. We scored two goals. You know, there might have been, I think he said there might have been four really good passes or four good bits of teamwork. And it was something like that. And actually, I, st I kind of stood back and, and the whole kind of environment just changed. Every, all the players were absolutely glued to the stats and, and to, the, to the other lab giving the information. And I was like, different voice for them, is, isn't it? As well, is, our, is, our, is our input actually that big? Yeah, you know, is it actually more valuable for peer feedback? And how good does that make the the kid who's telling the feedback? How good does that make them them feel? Especially exactly. if you give them the challenge of right, you've you've recognised it. Now, how are you going to say if it was a forward player or someone who was going to play forward in that next uh, bit of the game? How do they then go and fix it for themselves? Yeah, I think that really would work well. One thing I seen as well, that when I was, it was before I was coaching, when I was refereeing, it was around the time when Leicester won the Premiership, and one of these teams had had their coaches on the side, and every goal kick they were either shouting Leicester or Tottenham, I think it was something like that. If it was Leicester, they all had to press together and like force the other team back straight away. If it was Tottenham, it was let them come to the halfway line before stealing it. I think that's a good, good way of like picking up on current trends of what's happening in the game and how do they how do they work that? Definitely, yeah, because I, I, can, I can relate to that completely, Jamesy, that on my, uh, we had a UEFA Beast kind of webinar a couple of weeks ago that um, one, one of the coaches for Liverpool actually analysed kind of some of his playing and said, constantly was reminding his players, you know, have we got our Van Dijk? And then one of the players would run back and be the centre-half or have we got our Firmino? You know, and that kind of stuff is so relatable to the players because they get instead of going like, "Have we got our centre half?" and they might think, "I don't know what that actually means." They might know it's more as a defender. You know, the terminology we use with them is so crucial, and the context we put it in in, in the current climate is so important. And um, but kind of rolling back towards the question now, does anyone kind of have any final thoughts before we move on? I think definitely lockdown is is given a lot of people the opportunity to get familiar with a lot of different tools that can be useful in the future and also because they can't coach them i don't know how many coaches have been doing it but i've continued to train three times a week my my life because i just love um, coaching optional um tactical analysis as well on thursdays just to watch one half of the game and we just discuss it really and um you know just it's, it's quite easy now to to really first of all i think Kind of figure out you, like as a coach, figure out what you wanna you wanna write down as your tactics or your ideas, and kind of seal them in a certain way for for a new coming season. After you know, consuming a lot of information from different coaches and and, and reading, which we'll probably go into now, uh, which is the next question. Is can I figure out you? Figure out what your tactics are, and figure out what stats of an analyzing are important and related to the way and the style you play. Can I kind of just ask one question before we move on uh, around how tactics and analysis have evolved? Do we think social media has been a positive or negative advancement on tactics and analysis because there are so many analysis and tactical pages on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, you name it, YouTube, anywhere you look. Is it actually a positive impact or are we cramming too much tactical analysis and we're forgetting I've got to say, the other couple of corners. I've got to say both because it links back again to what we were saying last week, Ryan, about highlight players. You see what you see what those people putting the videos out want you to see. So if it's a say it's a Man United uh, Twitter account that are putting out clips and videos and they don't like say they don't like who plays enough uh, Jones, 
they could technically find of something that he's done wrong and blame him for what happens when it could really have nothing to do with it. But at the same time, if they loved him, clip that makes him the best thing since sliced bread. We kind of see through social media what people want to see. Well, kind of like the news. Yeah, I think as a coach, you've got to trust your own filter. So what you go and see out there, sometimes you just got to say, who's that audience aimed at for? Um, especially, you know, you've got to ask yourself, is that aimed at what I'm doing? Is it aimed at what someone else is doing? Or is it just aimed at that person's own benefit to make themselves sound important? Um, and usually when you ask yourself that question, you get the answer of, I need to read this or I don't need to read this. And then you move off. And not, I've, I'm guilty of back in the day, just reading everything and everything and trying to make it relatable to what I'm doing. But 75% of it wasn't the target audience, wasn't for what I was doing. And I just ended up wasting time and time and ended up creeping into other areas. So if you ask yourself, who's it's, it for? It's, it's not, it's Jack, sorry to interrupt you there. I don't believe it's wasted because this is what, this, this is the thought I had believed. Sometimes that 75% lets you figure out what you don't like. That, yeah. that, that time that you implement, you figure out, well, this isn't for me, you know? But you need to spend that time on, and we go back to self-awareness and knowing what you think is important to you, and you need to go through a lot of shit to get there. Yeah. You know, you need to go through a lot of wasted time, but it's not wasted because you figure out, right, that isn't for me, so I don't, you know, consume any more of that. To a certain, so you, you kind of figure yourself out, I think. And now, as you say, now you, you're able to have that filter and you feel comfortable with that filter, but it's taken, you know, that, that time to actually get to that point, which is key and essential for everybody. It's kind of like we try and give and feed the players loads of, of, of realities that we know are going to be, you know, real. You, we, you should do this, but at the end of the day, until they go through it themselves, until they experience it, they won't realize it's, it's, it's not going to happen i can say this is key information fine but you'll maybe only see it's key when you've gone through the 75 percent of information that you think was useless yeah yeah definitely um, i feel like we could talk about that for hours really and um, really enjoying this by the way it's some really in insightful thought as well and um, let's move on to the third topic um harry do you want to kind of fire this away yeah, well, it's basically, uh, well, I'll keep it to the question. Um, is reading books about football from different professional managers helpful or does it create confusion? And I say this because, obviously, you can read the biography on Klopp and you can read the biography on Guardiola and you can read the biography and, you know, you'll get fired up by every single one of these, these, these biographies and, and, obviously, you can read a lot of books on, I'm reading one or two now from Michael Cox and then on tactics and analysing. And I think this really, we've just covered it more or less on, on, but let's say for those out there that might be readers, I mean, I love reading. I'm never going to stop reading just because I know that I'm going to take maybe 20% or 10 or 5% out of a book. For me, that 5% is important. Same and likewise with the 95% I can filter. Before I could only filter maybe 25% and I try and use 75%, which was a massive mistake, learn from it. And now I filter the opposite way taking 5%, taking 10% and, and leaving that 90%, you know, um, maybe just, just for another, another person to, to find out themselves. What, what do you guys think? Yeah, I you know, really like that. Um, but I really like kind of the way you put it into context there, Harry, that, you know, you might only get 10% from that book that you spent reading. You know, it might take you months to read or whatever it takes, but I think you'll get that from every book. You'll get one key message that kind of reasons with you. And if you can implement that with your coaching, you know, it's going to make you a better coach. And, you know, that's what they're there for. You know, I, I don't think many people expect to, to in, inhale all 100% of the book and, and then, digest, and then you know, gurge it out into their coaching practice because that's not realistic. But if you can take away that one key message and you keep reading books, you know, you're going to read maybe 10, 11, 12 books in a year, you know, even more. And if you can take, you know, one key message from all of them, you know, you're coming out with 12 new key points. That might be massive for a new coach. It's like a, uh, like a movie or a series, isn't it? To be fair, if you can you can watch a series that you've already watched, but then pick up the second time round things that you missed the first time, or we'll kind of note what points we want to take out of it when we watch, like a film, for example. But if if you were quizzed on what happened in the fourth, third example of this movie, you might not have a clue. It's the same as reading. To be fair, you pick up like say the stuff that's uh, like for you and what you're looking for. But that's what you've got to do, to be fair. You, 
Also, you yeah. know, Harry, Harry Ryan, you know, I'm not one for reading. We'd have the capacity for it at the minute, but I think I will. But when you look at it, you've got a kind of, like Harry says, you can read about autobiographies about all these players, but you've got to kind of take out what works, what will work for you and how you'll adapt it to work with you. You can't just read a book and think, right, Guardiola does this with Manchester City. I'm going to go with my under nines and make make the same session. It's not going to work. You've got to kind of be ready to adapt and take the positives. And, uh, I think what's great about it, with you. I think what's great about all these books is you almost see and you can see in depth, and this is the key, you can see in depth what people have been through to get where they are. You know, in a, in a series and documentary, an hour, 55 minutes, you get like a glimpse of it, but you don't get, you know, the, the, you know, the deep stuff. And there's, in books, the thing I really like is people go deep. You know, to be able to have a good book and write a good book, it needs to have a, a few things that you can only share in a book. And I didn't initially love reading at school. I even hated it, if, if not that, because I wasn't reading about stuff that I enjoyed. And, and yes. Liked. Now, after I chose my first book, funny that, when you choose your first book and you read it, um, you suddenly figure out that, you know, depending on maybe even the month or the day that you pick up that book, I've currently got four books on the go. And I have one in different places and parts of my house, depending on the state of mind I want to be in. Obviously, now I used to have one in the car before, before, between sessions in case I wanted to take into the changing room and read a few pages. One just in the living room. I'll have one um, before bed because I don't want it to get me excited. It needs to be about something. So it's about knowing yourself. And you don't have to read them from start to finish. And this is the key thing. So many people think you need to open a book and you need to read every single page in it. Or if not, you have to feel guilty that you didn't read it. Fuck that. You want to you jump to the next? Um, chapter hello you can you know you're not enjoying a chapter it's not you know find one that you do read through the index and only read the chapters that excite you you don't have to read the book start to finish as they show you at school you're the one in charge you know and if you're not enjoying a chapter you don't think this is interesting jump to the next chapter jump until you find something that interests you you know so many people feel like they have to do it in a certain way and there's so many different ways of reading you know, I get loads out of pictures, loads out of pictures. So I'll jump to a picture, you know, I'll jump, if I'm not enjoying what I'm reading, I'm not enjoying this chapter or I'm not feeling it because it's, you know, it might be that day. I'll go to wherever I want or I can jump to an end chapter to see if it changes. And, you know, if I feel any curiosity of what the, how the book has led to that, or I just close the book and say, nah, that wasn't for me. Jack, you'll get a real idea of uh, Harry's passion on books. Me and Ryan were kind of left, were left in Waterstones. Didn't know how he's, we went. He's got we me went hooked now. <laughs> Harry's got Harry's got me hooked now. I can't stop. <laughs> we, we went, didn't we? He's we, down in Newcastle. For anyone listening, we're in Newcastle and uh, we found Waterstones. Didn't we, Harry? And you were just like a kid, kid in a sweet show. Me, me and Ryan kind of left you there. Came came back within what at least two hours, I'd say, and Easily. you. Just, Loved it, yeah. Uh, what a yeah, song. Harry, you were my, uh, yeah, you were my, uh, you are my influence to buy my first kind of coaching football book. Kind of, I've read like, I've read kind of autobiographies and and that kind of stuff before when I was younger. But I was like my first real coaching, kind of looking at the coaching side of the game. It was my first real kind of eye eye opener to go. This might actually like, this might be something I'm into. And then a year and a half later, I think I've read eight or nine books now and I just can't stop like it, it is it, I, I also find it that it's as well as relaxing and educational I actually find it's quite fun you know if it's not fun why are you doing it <laughs> and it builds your self-discipline as well it builds your self-discipline yeah, it, it builds your self-awareness it, bi- it builds your 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 capacity your self-conscious you know it, it does it builds patience you know it builds patience it's hard it's not easy to sit down and read a book you know, you've got, a, you've got, you know, for a fact that you've got a mobile phone next to you or a laptop that you can literally flip through information at the speed of light. You can't do that with a book. You know, you need to get your body and mind into a place, you know, to be able to read. And it takes courage. It's funny that it takes courage to read a book, but it does. Yeah, it does, definitely. I think the best yeah. example of that at the moment is uh, obviously The Last Dance being on Netflix. And everyone's gone about how great it is. 
it's been in paperback. Phil Jackson, Eleven Rings, has been out for God knows how long. That book is ten times better than this series on Netflix right now. Yep. And, and but, it's, but, but it's easier. But it's easier to go and watch, it, to go for, and watch for, it for ten hours. You know everything because you see Michael Jordan doing slam dunk. You think, hang on a minute. What how People are just they, lazy. Yeah, <laughs> but it is. You're not going to find the stories out for a documentary. No, and, and there's some documentaries, like there's one in Amazon Prime right now, I've watched two lately, and they're not in English, and they're not in Spanish. So they're not in either language that I understand. So I'm watching one in French and one in Portuguese with English subtitles. You know, people will literally not watch them because they're not in the native tongue. Yeah. It's crazy, you know, great for us, because, you know, you're missing out. <laughs> That's fine, <laughs> I, I love it, so, you know, I'll, I'll share it with you, or maybe not. <laughs> But there's like a French, um, going into the World Cup, I think there's a French documentary and there's four sessions and you've got, you know, you can just say, see inside the locker room of all these professional yes. clubs and national teams and like the tests that we like run and on, keep on going on about. It's great to see the day-to-day -day life. I mean, yeah. man management, feedback, um, you know, team meetings, group cohesion, you know, group downfalls, you know, how, how to rebuild a culture. How to create an identity. You know, it's all out there. You know, people are, oh, it's cricket. I've never watched cricket game in my life. <laughs> never. Just in, like, in Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones talk about when he goes to Japan in his book and he didn't speak, the, you know, but he could read body language. It's a universal language, you know. And yeah. I read that one sentence and I thought, yeah, you know, body language universal. And every time you look at your player now, if he's looking at Japanese players, that's 20, 30 years ago, you think, hang on a minute. What am I missing out? What am I missing? You know, as I walk, the players walking towards you from the car park. There's your message. You don't even need to speak to them. You've got something else done straight away. Just little things I think, like that. I, I think that the more I know we're going off topic here, but I think the more like like you say in there, there, Jack, that the more you get to know your players, like you can sense from the way they walk from the car to your training session. You know, oh, they're in a bad mood. You know, I'm going to have to cheer them up, or I'm going to have to get them going here, or oh, they're in a great mood. Let's get the session going. Let's get it bouncing. You know, that by getting that development of relation over time that you're going to find that you know when your players are up and down and you know how to lift them and, and kind of raise the tempo as well and looking at I, I recently just finished watching the all or nothing Brazilian national team one um, that was really good and I really liked uh, Chiche the, the Brazilian coach he is so he is all about religion and, and how it's, a, it's really amazing how religion brings them together and that culture of you know for their God and, and for what they believe in, how it brings them all together is something really special. It's amazing how, how, how the Brazilians, how they're very, you know, the, the cells are very spontaneous, but yeah. when it's that moment before they go out or when it's that moment of, of, you know, pray before they play, everybody's disciplined in it. You know what I mean? Everybody's a hundred percent. They understand it's the culture, it's the identity. And this is what I think brings a lot when you've got a national coach that's from the, the actual country and understands the culture. There's a lot of national coaches that are from the country and don't understand the national culture and they've been living there their whole life. But, you know, you've got to understand what brings the players together. And in that documentary, what brings the players together before and after the match and during the weeks as well is religion. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so powerful. I think it goes back to what you said, Harry, um, about the cricket. You know, I've watched that as well, that, you know, Justin Langer, the Australian coach, says as soon as as soon as he takes the role, you know, we're not just winning cricket matches now, we're we're winning back, you know, the heart of the Australian people after the scandal, you know, and that absolutely rings kind of quite prominently that it's it's not just football in a way, it's actually you know bringing people together and and giving them something that they can kind of confide over or believe in, as well mm -hmm. as you know go and support. Totally. Strange, isn't it, how sport works? Because, like, New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina happened, and then New Orleans Saints come together and find a way to go and win a Super Bowl. Didn't have a stadium in place at the start of the season, had to play in London, come over to here play. How do these things, they all seem to come from some sort of back, you know, some sort of problem, some sort of disaster, all these, but that brings the culture together. And it's strange how you can link it together. The right person with the right leadership can bring it together. And if you don't go it out and explore that, how are you going to recognise when that moment, that epicentre of that disaster is where you can get everyone together? And I think that drink brings out the true people as well. Um, and you know, you, you'll find it in reading books about the, the different professional managers that that they're actually quite true of themselves a lot of the time. You know, they'll recognise, uh, you know, 
I haven't upheld to what I normally go through this week or, you know, I've been solid this week, you know, and it's reflected in what they do in the practices. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think, I think we've covered all three kind of topics really, really well there. Um, and it's been a really insightful chat, guys. Um, it's been Jack, a pleasure, guys. Wrap it up. Yeah. No worries. Thanks, I've been a pleasure. Yeah, Jack, we really appreciate, you know, you giving up your time and, and coming on and giving us your thoughts. It's been really insightful and, and a lot got, to a got a page of notes. I'm good to go. <laughs> no, we, we also, Jack, we also appreciate, we, we know you mentioned and you, you're very aware of um, what we're posting and you always leave uh, one or two comments and yeah. we really appreciate that because it really helps us, um, you know, evolve, get to know you as well, get to know thoughts and feelings from other people. And a lot of people, you know, listen to it or consume a lot of content but don't give any feedback. And what, they, what they're doing is they're not helping their next content, you know? What's great about content is the fact that they adapt the content to my, my consuming myself. So if, if you're able to comment or leave a, a comment on anything you consume, it helps the people consume and um, create better content. I mean, look at Jack. That's an absolute perfect example. You know, Jack, you've been commenting on our stuff for the last few weeks now and, you know, you've come on and, and we've had an absolutely <laughs> brilliant chat. You know, it, it absolutely rings quite, quite strongly that, you know, so... Thank you very much. Well, big enough and silly enough us to be on take it the right way. So when we see Jack commenting on something, we know it's like Harry says, it's to benefit us. Yeah. And to benefit what we're doing. And yeah. But you don't get anywhere by sitting still. I like that. So the, way I look, the way I look at it is I see you guys doing this and you go, hang on a minute, they're doing that. Why are they doing that? They want to go here. What can I learn from them? And that's what how I stumbled across, you know, listened in for, ah, oh, there was a moment Graham mentioned last week or the week before. I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I need to write that down. What would I be doing if I wasn't doing that right now? There's no webinar. I'm not going to sit on through a webinar. I'm not, you know, I did one of those FNA webinars and you sat there watching. And there's no personal link. Yeah. Whereas here, look what we've just done for the last hour. I've got a, page and a full page of notes, squiggles everywhere. Much better. Perfect. But well, yeah, we'll wrap it up on that. So guys, as always, thanks for your time. Um, anyone who's listened to this, thank you very much or watched it. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to, to comment, subscribe, you know, leave a like and share it around with everyone. We really appreciate any, any feedback or, or any kind of shares that you do. Uh, so thank you very much. Cheers, Peace. guys. Cheers, guys. Thank you.